All right, humans, hope you're doing well. I miss you. I wish I was teaching you civics here in this classroom at wonderful Hobbs Middle School. But alas, that shall not be. I will not see you until you come back as big bad eighth graders. So please come back here to the labyrinths, back here in the uh, little seventh grade area, say hello. Um, I miss you. I'll be happy to see you again next year. We're going to continue on chapter 25 talking about the United States as one of 194 other countries. We started this issue with the uh, last lesson and we were talking about this conflict, whether a country can be isolated and keep to themselves or whether they have to be integrated into the global economy, integrated with 193 other countries. You could argue the rights, wrongs, and what's the best path, best path to take. But if we're talking about this lesson in, in particular, we're going to see that the United States, over its history, has realized that, yeah, well, George Washington said stay out of foreign entanglements. But guess what? We have to be a part of these 193 other countries. There is some level of work, teamwork, interdependence we have to have with these other nations. So how are we going to do it? In this lesson, we're going to see usually the United States participates in and joins these international organizations. Abby, do you know any international organizations that the United States is part of? Um, no. How about the biggest one, like every country in the world is part of? It's got its headquarters in the uh, New York City. Like what, the League of Nations or something? The United Nations. Excellent. And we're going to see we're part of the United Nations. We're part of these uh, organizations that work across the globe. Some of them are going to be government organizations like the United, uh, United Nations. Some are private organizations that are just run by people and businesses, not by countries. So we're going to talk about governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations with the big difference between governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations, just guess Abby being? The government. The government. Who runs it? If it's a governmental organization, it's run by, it's participated in by the United States government as the United States government. Non-governmental organizations are private organizations that people belong to, people join, and they're not linked to any government at all. The United Nations, uh, United Nations, Government organization. We've heard about a lot during COVID, the WHO. Government organization. Doctors Without Borders, non-governmental organization, a private organization. All right. Review, what's an ambassador? Uh, a leading diplomat. A leading diplomat, the lead diplomat. We appoint ambassadors to just about every country in the world. The president picks them. The Senate confirms them, and they become the United States representative to that government. So Abigail, uh, she speaks French fluently. She started when she was young. She kept it up in high school and college, and she has a minor in French. Her major is in political science. She's worked in international organizations uh, across the world. She's an expert in France and all things France. A president might appoint her as an ambassador to France. Abigail now represents the United States the country of France. She moves to France. She lives in the capital of France, which is what? I don't know. Name a French city. Uh, Paris. Paris is the capital <laughs> of France. She'll live, she'll live in Paris, and you know what the building is that hosts our ambassador and all our diplomats in France? Starts with, an, starts with an E. Eiffel Tower. An embassy. So they will work in the United States Embassy in Paris, France. There are diplomats, people who are job is, is to work with other countries, and they're led by an ambassador. That's our senior diplomat. That is our representative to the government of France. Abby, are there any countries we don't exchange ambassadors with? Probably. Probably there are. Can you name one country that you'd say, that's probably a country we don't have an ambassador for? Um, Afghanistan. 
No, we do because, of course, we're trying to rebuild Afghanistan. Um, Real Uganda. bad guys make nuclear weapons. Scary North dictators. Korea. North Korea. North Korea is an example that we don't have an ambassador there. We have no ambassador. We have no embassy. So you're saying, gee, they're bad people. And I understand why we don't like them. It kind of makes sense. We don't have an ambassador. But then, how do we deal with North Korea? We don't. Makes, we don't in a lot of ways. And technically what we do is we deal through third countries and all that stuff. Great, good review. The biggest military alliance in the world and the most important military alliance that the United States is a part of is? NATO. NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It is the United States, our syrup-loving, donut-eating, brothers and sisters to the north of Canada, and at this point, most of Europe. The big part about NATO is that we agree that if any member of NATO is attacked, we all come to each other's aid. It is the single most important defense treaty that the United States is involved in. It was created to defend the United States and Europe from the awful communist Soviet Union. Of course, the Soviet Union falls apart in 1989, becomes the must, much less powerful but still tricky Russia, but it still existed after that. And the only time NATO actually had to come to another nation's support is the United States. When we were attacked in 2001, NATO said, we're standing with you, uh, America. So uh, if you served in Afghanistan like I did, I had the great fortune to serve at a NATO command. So uh, the place I worked, my chief deputy was a Canadian. I had a Croatian guy who did certain things for me. The German guys were downstairs. They shared an office with the British guys. The Italian guys were across the street. The French were just down the street from there. It wasn't America fighting this war by itself. We had NATO allies to help us. And it's a great thing. I am. Tremendously pro-NATO. Why? Because I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Be careful when you hear about uh, politicians who are anti-NATO. I'm sure they have good reasons. But uh, uh, my ears perk up whenever I hear anybody downgrading NATO or talk about the United States leaving NATO. Uh, but that's my personal opinion, which I try to keep out of this as much as possible. But you need to know NATO. And if there's anything to know, it's our most important military alliance. It's us, Canada, and basically at this point, most of Europe, all of us agree to defend each other if anybody's attacked. Learn more about NATO, please. Click those links and get a better idea of what NATO is all about. WTO, now we're talking about trade. So we talked about a lot about international trade in the last lesson. International trade is the sum of imports and exports going across the globe. The WTO tries to act as a referee to make sure that trade is free and fair amongst all countries. So they're sort of the international organization that helps countries work through these trade wars um, like the United States and China. Do countries need to listen to the WTO? No, countries are always able to do whatever they see is fit, best for that country, but the WTO exists to try to promote free and fair trade and uh, productive trade agreements between nations. Because you would like to have some sort of rule and referees to run the show. Some countries cheat, absolutely. Do some people say, oh, the referees are terrible? Absolutely. So people will complain about the WTO, but it exists there for a reason, to try to be a arbiter and referee for all these trade issues. Non-governmental organizations are organizations that could be big and popular and powerful and have a great amount of impact, but they're run by individuals, not by nations. So big examples, International Committee of the Red Cross, usually shortened to Red Cross. The Red Cross doesn't care who you are, where you are, what uniform you wear. They are solely about helping people 
particularly, they specialize in helping people during war. So affected civilian populations, refugees, the Red Cross does a lot of work in trying to help these populations that are affected and impacted by war. And again, they're neutral. So they do a lot of work with prisoners of war. Abigail is in the United States Army. She gets captured by an enemy force. She is now a prisoner of war. What organization exists to try to make sure that Abby's being properly treated? The Red Cross. The Red Cross will go into all these countries, prisoner of war camps, meet with the prisoners and try to make sure they're being treated well. Because there are laws of war. We talked about it a couple lessons back. If I capture an enemy combatant, an enemy soldier, there's rules on how I'm supposed to treat them. Who acts as the referee for this? The Red Cross. They'll go into the prison camp and say, hello, Abigail, we have you on our list. Uh, you're registered as a prisoner of war. Are you being treated well? Are you being fed? Do you get medical care when you're sick? Let me see your clothes. Let me see where you live. Let me see your bed. So the Red Cross doesn't care about borders or nations. It doesn't take sides. It's not pro-Russian or pro-Chinese or pro-American. It is pro-affected civilian populations, and it's also there to protect the rights of um, prisoners of war. Any questions on the Red Cross? Oh, the Red Cross isn't just the Red Cross. No. In some parts of the world, it goes by the name the Red Crescent. Do you have a guess why it wouldn't want to be called the Red Cross everywhere in the world? Maybe because in some parts of the world, they don't want to be involved in war in any way. Or like they don't do that. Is the cross used as a symbol by anybody? Oh, uh, yeah. What are some organizations that use the cross as a symbol? Uh, Christians? Christians do. So... In Muslim countries, they go by a Muslim symbol, which is a crescent. So in some places of the world, they're the Red Cross. Some places, they're going to be the Red Crescent. Why? To respect these uh, religious differences. The United Nations was created after World War II. The world got together and said, hey, World War II was horrible. I mean, you know, 80 million people dead. Entire continents devastated. Devastated. Europe, like, border to border, flattened, no economy, refugees all over the place. How do we not have a World War III? So they create the United Nations. It's not completely new. Abby mentioned the League of Nations, which was the predecessor to the United Nations. But we create this international organization called the United Nations. It's headquartered in the greatest, most powerful country in the world and its biggest, most important city. The United Nations is headquartered in New York City, New York, United States of America. What is the United Nations' main goal, Abigail? To keep peace across the world. Try to keep, keep peace across the world. How good of a job is it doing? Not very good. <laughs> Not a perfect job by any stretch of the imagination. Are there are terrible wars going on right now. Mm -hmm. Have we had a war as bad as World War II? No. No! So some people will argue that the United Nations is a complete failure. Look how messed up the world is. Keep that in mind. Have we had another World War III? We have not. So some people will say UN, UN has been successful in its key job. UN isn't just about keeping peace. It does health stuff, World Health Organization, social problems, um, justice issues, the United Nations tries to address those things. But is that extremely challenging work? Sure. China, Russia, the United States, Canada, and England aren't going to all agree on ideas of justice or social justice or government or how to do these things. The UN is a very imperfect tool to solve these problems, but it does exist, and I think in most times it tries its best. Organizationally, the UN General Assembly Howdy, sir. The, video lesson? Yes, video lesson. All video people. <laughs> Mr. Bohan, and you'll see him teaching you history next year, seventh graders, at least half of you will. If they're lucky. If they're lucky, of course. So the UN's big 
meeting is the General Assembly. All 194 countries get a seat there, and the person sitting in that seat is their ambassador to the United Nations. And yes, they meet in New York City. Every country gets a vote. The UN Security Council is a smaller part of the United Nations that specializes in security issues. It was created after World War II. It was really created by the winners of World War II. So the winners of World War II, when they created the UN and the UN Security Council, assigned five permanent members to the United Nations Security Council, and the five permanent members are? The United States, Russia, UK, France, China. So the winners of World War II basically wrote themselves on to the Security Council. The winners of World War II also become the five biggest nuclear armed nations. So even today, 70 years after World War II, there's five permanent members on the Security Council, those big five, the winners of World War II, and the ones that hold most of the world's nuclear weapons. What does that mean? There are temporary countries that rotate on the Security Council, but there's always those big five there to kind of run the show. All right, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The WHO, World Health Organization, what does it deal with, Abby? World Health. World Health, has it had some great successes? Yes. Absolutely. World Health Organization basically has shut down this horrible disease called uh, polio is basically shut down this terrible disease called smallpox. It has led the world's uh, battle against another terrible disease, HIV AIDS. Is it perfect? No. You're gonna hear WHO in the news right now. People are gonna say, WHO, you messed up COVID. You didn't do a good job in making sure the world was ready and protected from the um, pandemic that's happening now. It's a tough job and it's complicated. Um, it's not easy predicting and dealing with global epidemics, particularly because these ideas that this is international issue. Is China gonna to wanna to do the same things as Italy or US or Russia or France in dealing with these issues? But I think WHO usually tries to do its best in um, protecting the world from global pandemics, and it has had some great victories. Smallpox was a horrible disease killed millions of people, and if you um, survive smallpox, typically you were disfigured, because one of the things that happens on smallpox, you would get covered basically head to toe with uh, terrible like boils and skin lesions, and even if you survived, you were all scarred up after it. Um, but there's no smallpox anymore in the wild. The only place smallpox exists in, military laboratories. What do they do with it? Uh, the United <laughs> States keeps samples of smallpox, and the United States would say, just in case somebody wants to use smallpox as a weapon somewhere down the line, we have ways to make better vaccines and our own smallpox weapons. Well, we won't say that second part. Second part. Didn't we do that in World War II? We did not use any chemical or biological weapons during World War II, no but we had them on standby if the Germans and Japanese used them. Wasn't there that whole scandal where like the United States helped, helped or like maybe like helped but like covered up them using like diseases as like weapons? Hmm. With like, there's like a, it's like. All, all the major belligerents in World War I used chemical weapons against each other. Things like mustard gas and things like that. Um, and that was bad enough, so when World War II happened, everybody, even like the bad, bad guys, like Nazi Germany and Japan, everybody refused to use any kind of chemical or biological weapons. Now there was experimentation with chemical and biological weapons. And chemical and biological weapons have been used after World War II. Um, Syria used chemical weapons against its own people. Iraq used uh, chemical weapons against its own people. Terrorists have used chemical and biological weapons. But no, uh, the major world powers have used chemical and biological weapons 
since World War I. Um, there's been experimentation. The U.S. government has used these things on its own people, which is a scandal, because what did they do? They, uh, the famous one is the U.S. government basically exposed um, people to syphilis, and of course they used African Americans for these experiments, which of course is a tremendous scandal, but it's not using those as a deliberate weapon against people. Did I answer your question? Would people, would we ever like get to a point where you use COVID against people? Or that's, like keep it? That's why a lot of these organizations exist. So that is a great fear. We're the United States, we're militarily powerful, but what if somebody somewhere, a terrorist, engineers a super COVID and releases that in the United States? Yeah. These things are plausible, and that's why we have organizations designed to detect and defeat that. Now, how good are they? I don't know. How are we handling COVID right now? Not great. Right. Uh, I mean, not perfectly, by any stretch. Peace Corps, this is run by the U.S. government. It's easy enough to join the War Corps and learn to go around the world blowing people up. John F. Kennedy said, hey, we're good at going around the world and blowing people up. Why don't we learn how to go around the world and be nice to people? So we've created this U.S. government organization called the Peace Corps, and that's what you do. You join up, and it's just like uh, you sign up for 27 months or something like that. And you grow around the world and you're nice to people. You uh, help them with medical care, education, sanitary facilities, clean running water, things like that. Why do we do that? To be nice to people. But why do we really do that? We are trying to affect foreign countries to appreciate the United States by things like the Peace Corps. So those people now don't want to be enemies of the United States. They look favorably upon the United States. Now are going to be terrorists trying to blow up the United States. Why? Because they had clean drinking water in their village, courtesy of the U.S. Peace Corps. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. More on the Peace Corps. It's interesting. Um, give those links a click. You get a high school, college, and you have some um, skills and abilities, but you don't know what you're going to do with your life. A lot of young Americans join the Peace Corps, go overseas and work in a disadvantaged country for a little over two years and then come back and do their thing. Lesson review. Awesome. Have a good afternoon or evening. <laughs>